Okay, we're starting uh, our next unit um, here. We're going to go big, going to go global geology. We're going to start plate tectonics. This is your next set of flip notes, uh, flip notes uh, set number 20, um, plate tectonics notes set number one. So let's get started. Have your uh, PowerPoint in front of you and follow along and fill in the blanks. Here we go. So a brief overview of plate tectonics. Um, you need to know that plate tectonics is a very powerful geological uh, theory, geological model, and it is so powerful that all geological processes can be described by it. And a relatively new um, scientific theory, it wasn't fully accepted by the majority of Earth scientists until man had walked on the moon. So we're going to use a time frame of around 1970. And lastly, a theory so grand that it really changed our view of the interior structure of the Earth and what's going on beneath our feet. So if you want a definition, a long-winded definition of plate tectonics, it says it's the modern theory of geology, which says that the outer layer of the Earth is made up of about 20 individual sections, and we call those sections plates, and each of those plates are floating on a partially melted layer of the mantle, and these plates are in constant motion relative to each other, smashing into one another, grinding past one another, and ripping apart from one another. So if you look at a map of the known plate locations and superimpose the land masses on top of it, this is what you'll see. And we need to get a good understanding, a good handle on the realization that the plate boundaries do not match the coastlines. In some places they seemingly do, but this, for instance, is the South American plate. And while it does contain the South American continent, a vast um, majority of the South American plain is actually Atlantic Ocean seafloor bottom. Same thing with the North American plate. The North American plate includes the majority of the North American continent, but it also includes huge sections of the North American, excuse me, the North Atlantic Ocean seafloor. It also includes the Arctic Ocean seafloor and so on and so forth. There's the Pacific Plate, the Nazca Plate, Cocos Plate, the Caribbean Plate, African Plate, a Eurasian Plate, Arabian Plate, the Australian Indian Plate, the Philippine, Philippine Plate, the Antarctic Plate, and this small one up here, Juan de Fuca Plate. Oops, forgot about this, the Scotia Plate down near the southern tip of South America. And you're going to learn all these, and you're going to be able to identify them on a map. All right? But in the beginning, before there was plate tectonics, <clears throat> talk about a theory or hypothesis known as continental drift. You've probably heard of continental drift. You need to make sure you have it straight in your head that continental drift is not the same as plate tectonics. These are not identical. Right? Continental drift was proposed by Alfred Wegener, a German weather scientist. He was a meteorologist. <clears throat> and he had great data to support his hypothesis, but unfortunately continental drift really was an idea before its time. People simply were not ready to accept the idea that the land masses uh, were moving and that the Earth's surface was very dynamic rather than static, which is what the held belief at the time was. So let's look at Alfred Wegener. In 1915 he published a book entitled The Origins of the Oceans and the Continents. Very powerful book. Uh, had a lot of things in it, but uh, one of the main points in it was the radical crazy, at the time, idea of continental drift. Continental drift 
uh, was the hypothesis that all the continents were once connected, like a giant jigsaw puzzle, and they were connected in a giant supercontinent, and he called that supercontinent, supercontinent Pangaea. Pangaea would be the proper pronunciation. Pan meaning all, and Gaia meaning Earth, all Earth. And over the last 200 million years, Pangaea broke apart. The continents drifted and floated through the oceans, much like icebergs or rafts. And the continents have now found themselves in their current locations. That was the basics of continental drift. So, that really went against the standard thinking of the time, which was that all continents were fixed, the Earth's surface was very static, and that the Earth um, was the way it always had been. So where did he get this crazy idea? What was the evidence? Well, for our purposes, there's going to be four main lines of evidence. You need to make sure you understand these four and can um, explain them and defend them. The first is the continental jigsaw puzzle probably the most obvious, the idea that says that, hey, if you look at the land masses, some of them simply look like they would fit back together. If you cut out the land masses, Africa fits nicely up against South America. The east coast of the United States would actually fit nicely in here, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So number one is the continental jigsaw puzzle. Number two, Wegener studied many of the fossil records um, of his time, of the early 1900s, and he found identical fossils that matched up across great um, distances across the oceans. Fossils that wouldn't, organisms that wouldn't necessarily be able to um, swim those great distances or travel those great distances on their own. So he said, no, it's not that these organisms actually swam through the ocean or found some other means to get from one place to the other through migration. The idea is that Africa and South America were once connected, and the fossils found here and the fossils found here were actually um, family. They were living together because Africa and South America were connected. A couple of organisms in particular that we want to make sure we... Um, uh, learn is the Mesosaurus, which was a large swimming reptile, kind of like a freshwater alligator. That's actually what they're showing here in this illustration. And another one called Glossopterus. Glossopterus is um, a large, heavy seed pod from a fern. You can think of like a pine cone or a giant acorn. Something that wouldn't be able to be carried by the wind, something that wouldn't be able to float in. Um, seawater for the thousands of miles from one place to the other. So Wegener says, no, 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 they didn't travel. I account for this by putting Africa and South America together, and that's how the fossils match up. And South America and Africa weren't the only locations of these fossils. They um, are found all over the planet. Australia, Asia, Africa, North America, things like that. Third line of evidence that he used. Not only did fossils seemingly match up across great distances, but rock types and rock structures matched up when you put Pangaea back together. For example, if you look at the east coast of North America, there's a mountain range there called the Appalachians. And these mountains are, if you remember from your geography class, are not particularly high. They're, um, they're worn down. They're rugged, rolling hills. Uh, a lot of the rocks in there have folds and a lot of ancient metamorphic rocks in them. And if you get in a boat and you head, head over here to Scotland and then to Norway, you'll find in the Scottish Highlands and the Scandinavian mountains very similar, if not identical, rocks. Same type of ro uh, rolling, rugged, ancient hills and many of the same uh, ancient metamorphic rocks. 
So Wegner said, that's not just a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that there's um, mountain belts on either side of the Atlantic. If you put Pangaea back together, turns out that the Appalachians and the Scottish Highlands and the Scandinavian mountains actually line up very nicely, and they were their own continuous mountain belt uh, way back when, when Pangaea was together. Line of evidence number four was that there's some seemingly bizarre ancient climate data that didn't make sense. Wegener found ancient glacial deposits, which we learned about recently, in temperate regions and in tropical regions, areas that had the moraines and the drumlins and glacial carved features. So he concluded that, well, there's only two particular, there's only two uh, possibilities. One, the earth was completely covered by glaciers, even at the equator, or these locations were in a more arctic location. And indeed, when you put Pangaea back together, it turns out that South America, Africa, India, and Australia were very close to the South Pole. So that's how he accounted for the glacial deposits. Another um, strange, seemingly strange climate data was vast coal deposits in North America and in Canada, locations that are now relatively cold or certainly temperate. But if you remember how coal deposits form, they form how? Remember? They form from ancient swamps, usually a tropical uh, location, tropical type of area. And it turns out if you have, if you take <clears throat> Pangaea, put it back together in North America, will indeed be in a much more equatorial and tropical location. All right, so that's a brief overview, but um, those are the four lines of evidence. Review them. What were they? One, the jigsaw puzzle. Two, fossils matching up. Three, rock types matching up and four ancient climate uh, data that seems out of place, but if you shift the continents, turns out you can account for them. Well, in 1924, <clears throat> Wegener's book was published into English, and that was important because by the 1900s, the majority of uh, the scientific community was uh, British and American. So now... Um, English-speaking scientists were able to really pour through this and critique it and uh, get a good look at his um, hypothesis, and <clears throat> it just did not catch on. Two main reasons. Two main reasons is that he admittedly had no way to explain why they would move. What was the driving force? How in the world are you going to get these massive continents to move several inches per year. He had a few ideas, like maybe it was the moon's gravity that was um, pulling on the continents, and that's what caused them to shift. But mathematicians and physicists quickly did some calculations and pointed out that if the moon's gravity was so strong that it could pull uh, continents through the ocean, that the moon's gravity would actually cause the Earth to stop spinning in a matter of several hundred years. So the moon's gravity uh, idea quickly was um, shown not to be correct. And probably the main reason why um, this idea of continental drift was not accepted and why it didn't catch on was that uh, scientists simply weren't ready. Everybody had in their mind that it was uh, that the Earth's surface was fixed, it was static, the continents were in the same location that they'd always been. Any changes that the Earth's surface had were actually vertical in nature, up and down, mountains rising, erosion wearing them down, not a horizontal component of plates 
uh, sliding across the surface and grinding and smashing into one another. Unfortunately, in 1930, Wegener was only 50 years old. Um, in 1930, <clears throat> Wegener passed away. He died um, in an expedition in Greenland, so he was not able to continue um, his, his quest to prove that uh, continental drift was indeed occurring. So that takes us up to about 1930. Our next set of notes will pick up there and the realization that Wegener probably wasn't going to be able to prove his idea until several decades later when technology caught up with his idea. All right, so remember, review what plate, te what plate tectonics is. It's a very, very powerful geological model that explains many, many aspects of geology. Um, plate tectonics had its beginning in continental drift, which was devised by Alfred Wegener. Wegener had those four pieces of evidence. He had a couple of drawbacks. And then in 1930, <clears throat> uh, Wegener passed away. And he would have to wait about 40 or 50 years for plate tectonics to be fully realized. We're going to go with the date of 1970 as the date that plate tectonics really finally was first um, accepted, um, agreed upon by many of the Earth scientists that indeed, yes, that is how the Earth um, is functioning, what the surface is doing. All right, if you have any questions, come and talk to us. Thanks a lot. Good luck.